so yes, um, basically what we are showing is uh, how to make maliciously secure um, uh, distributed prime generation an order of magnitude faster than the previous semi-honest. And to give some numbers, we talk 15 minutes for the previous faster semi-honest versus around 40 seconds for uh, the new maliciously secure one. All right. Um, so what I will be talking about today is I will start with an introduction, then I will, uh, um, a sort of a motivation for how we get maliciously secure very fast, go through our semi-honest construction, and then I will talk about how, what we add on top to actually get a very fast maliciously secure construction, and in the end I will give a bit more of um, discussion regarding the efficiency and the implementation with it. All right, so just so we're all on the same page, I'm just gonna start very briefly to say what I mean when I talk about public key encryption. I mean uh, that we have a, a party or server that uh, can generate a private key and a public key. The public key can then be made public, uh, for example, given to another person. The other person can then encrypt some message at a later point in time using the public key, sending back, and then that can be decrypted so the server learns the message that was sent. So that's a, that's a general case, except that uh, since the public key is public, we can have many parties that actually uh, encrypt messages and send those to the server. So what I mean in the distributed, uh, distributed setting is that instead of having a single server, we have several parties that act sort of as the server in this case. So this means these parties are communicating together to construct a, um, uh, a sharing of a private key. Uh, along with a public key. So again, the public key can uh, be distributed and uh, some other party can encrypt the message with the public key and send it back to the two, uh, to the two, uh, two parties that act as the server. They can then uh, run a decryption algorithm um, using the shares of the secret key and uh, then in the end learn some partial uh, decrypted message which they can exchange to actually learn uh, the message that was supposed to be sent. All right. Uh, so why is this actually interesting? Uh, there are several cases where it makes sense to have a distributed private key in, a, in, a, in such a scheme. Uh, for example, uh, it can be used as a gateway to make uh, distributed signature schemes, which is an end in itself. Uh, it, is also, it also comes up in several MPC protocols, in particular when the public key encryption is, uh, uh, is uh, additively multiplicative homomorphic. Uh, and even more interesting, it can be used in a commercial setting you, uh, where you want to actually put um, a hardware security module in the cloud, meaning that you're, instead of actually having a box from, um, from Multimarco or Gamalto, uh, you actually have uh, two cloud servers that basically act as, uh, as the construct, uh, constructor and keeper of, uh, of the keys. Um, okay, so in this uh, specific work, we consider uh, the public key encryption scheme RSA. So why, um, why RSA? Well, uh, there's a lot of reasons. It's uh, tried, it's tested, it's very applicable in practice. It's used in a lot of places, TLS, PGP. And uh, furthermore, there's a lot of previous work in this setting, which I mean means that the community is interested in that, and it also makes it more fun to actually see how, uh, how fast you can get things going. Uh, and just to recap, uh, when I mean RSA in this case, I mean that we have a public key which, is, which we call n, uh, which is the product of uh, two large primes. Uh, we have a public exponent which we call e, uh, that's usually 3 or 2 to 16 plus 1. Um, and then we have the private key is the inverse of e modulo phi of uh, the public key n. Um, yeah. So in, the oh, sorry. Uh, so in the distributed setting of RSA, uh, basically what we consider uh, is, uh, is the same way as all previous work has considered is uh, that uh, the we generate primes as we would normally do in a, the general RSA case, except these primes are secret shared uh, in an additive, additive way. So each, part, so each of the two uh, parties acting as server, Alice and Bob, have an additive share of uh, a prime P and an additive share of a prime Q. Uh, these are multiplied together again to construct the, the public, uh, public key n. And then the private key is also an additive sharing such that when uh, the share of Alice and the share of Bob is added together, uh, we get the value of uh, the inverse of e modulo phi of n. All right, so now the question is how do we actually, uh, how do we do this? Well, we have, uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, have two parties and uh, we want something that's secret shared. I mean, uh, if we look at our toolbox uh, and a lot of the talks uh, this week, well, we have, a, we have a, 
very nice tool to solve this kind of thing, which is called MPC. So now we just have the parties pick random primes, do Rabin Miller to ensure, uh, pick random values, do Rabin Miller to ensure primality, and then repeat and just do it all in an MPC computation. Well, it would be nice if, uh, if that would actually be the case, then we would be done. Unfortunately, it's not because Rabin Miller is, um, is very inefficient to do an MPC because we are talking exponentiation of very large numbers along with modulo uh, reductions and so on. So it's very hard to actually get directly to work in a practical setting using uh, directly in MPC. Uh, so what we do instead, and with, uh, what basically all previous work in these settings have done instead, is uh, to do a, a, a few different phases that then end up with what we actually want. So the phase, the, it starts with a candidate generation phase where some sampling and light reading is done of, uh, of the secret shares of the primes. Afterwards, uh, a construction of the modulus is done in some secure manner. This modulus is then uh, verified in some way to ensure that it's actually a product of two primes. And then in the end, a phase is executed to actually construct the distributed keys. So just to give a little bit of a visual outline of, of this, we basically consider we have a whole bunch of random values in uh, the beginning, and then as part of the candidate generation phase, some get weeded out. These, get, uh, these then get, uh, get paired up uh, to construct uh, moduli. Uh, again, the moduli get weeded out because they might not actually be the product of two primes. So in the end, we have one moduli left, and then that gets split up into two uh, shares of, uh, of keys, which is what the parties will learn in the end, and, and then we're done. Okay, so that was a bit of an introduction regarding what we're actually looking at, and. Uh, What's the general approach to solve this issue? So let me give a bit more specific uh, start of how we do this in the semi-honest setting. All right, we start, uh, we start by, uh, by picking, uh, by picking uh, some random values uh, under the constraint that the sum of these are congruent to three modulo four. Then what we do is uh, we execute a trial division uh, based on uh, some ideas from, uh, from the 90s where uh, we use one out of, uh, out of beta OT to uh, ensure that the sum of these primes are not divisible by a small prime factor. Uh, so this basically means we have one party taking, uh, Alice taking her share, uh, PA modulo B, and using that as, uh, as, as, as a choice input to a one out of beta random OT. Uh, Bob gets uh, beta random strings, and Alice gets uh, the random string uh, that fits uh, PA modulo, uh, modulo B. Bob then computes uh, um, minus PB modulo beta, and then sends that to Alice, who can then compare whether they're equal or not. Um, and if they are equal, then it means that beta is actually a factor of the sum of uh, PA and, um, and PB, and thus it's definitely not a prime, and the candidate can be discarded. So this is a very efficient way because we have a lot of recent and excellent work in OT extensions. Um, so that's a very good, uh, good start to weed out a lot of random numbers that are actually not primes. <clears throat> Afterwards, when we have something that might be prime, maybe not prime, we want to compute the, the modulus n, which is basically computing the product of the sum of the, of the shares. This can also be done very efficiently using oblivious transfer by a protocol uh, by, uh, by um, Gilboa. Uh, the idea is basically that this protocol, we have two parties, one with the one fact and one with the other fact, and what you want to get is a uh, additive secret sharing. Uh, so what happens is the one party inputs a bit of her factor to uh, a one out of two OT. The other party input a random number plus his factor into the one out of two OT. Um, and then what uh, they get back can be, uh, can be used to create, a, um, a, can be used with linearity to create an additive secret sharing of what is actually the product of these two factors. Once we have uh, the modulus, we uh, need to execute a biprimality test for this. We uh, use uh, some excellent work by Bonnet and Franklin from 2001. I'm not going into detail with the math, uh, here, but it basically in involves some exponentiations. You need to do s times to ensure that uh, what you have in a public modulus is actually a product of two primes, except with uh, uh, exponentially small uh, probability. 
each of these iteration only gives, uh, give, give, can give a, fa a false positive with up to probability a half, so that's why it needs to be executed uh, many times. Finally, computing the actual additive share of the keys can be done uh, quite efficiently, also using the same approach as Bonnet and Franklin from 2001. Okay, so that was a brief outline of the semi-honest construction. As you might have noticed, uh, a lot of uh, these things we do here are actually based on previous work. And uh, that's completely intentional because our main contribution is actually how we take this and turn it maliciously secure. So to give an outline, if we look at what can go wrong in the semi-honest protocol uh, in case any of the parties act maliciously, um, well, there are, there are a few things. There's, uh, there's uh, the issue, issue of selective failure. There's the issue of not staying consistent with uh, what you pick as a prime share throughout the different stages of the protocol. And finally, but absolutely not leastly, there's the problem of correctness of biprimality. So the question is, how can we get this all to work securely in a malicious way without basically not, uh, not paying anything. And the main idea we had is that we give the adversary slightly more power than what we would normally allow in a way that's basically useless to him. Uh, so the idea is that the adversary is allowed to fail good candidates. So it means even if we construct a, um, something that is actually a, a prime and we have a product of two primes, the adversary is allowed, if he acts maliciously, to not use that. That doesn't really give him much power because the shares that are picked in this process are all random. So, so and, 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 uh, and, and by the fact that we want this protocol to only run in, um, what should we say, pretty finite time, uh, if, if he does this too much, well, then the other party will basically abort in that case. So he cannot run super do this super polynomially many times. The other thing we do uh, to ensure that, um, that this can be achieved very efficiently is that we uh, allow the adversary to learn a little bit of leakage on each of the prime shares, uh, which is not actually a big issue because, um, because they're all random, they're very long, and we can argue that it doesn't give him more. Uh, because the leakage is basically constant, it doesn't give him more than a constant ad advantage. So that's the main ideas we have of how to, of, uh, of, of, uh, of going here from the semi-honest construction to the maliciously secure construction. So the contribution is in how we actually do these steps. Well, um, the selective failure prevention uh, basically means that when we use OT in the malicious setting, there's almost always an issue of selective failure where one party can um, input uh, something malicious for the choice zero uh, and something right for the choice one, and then at a later point in time, depending on whether, whether the receiving party picks zero or one, we find out, uh, uh, according to an abort or not, uh, some information of, of this party's input. This can, uh, we, we show a way of how to do this, because uh, do this very efficiently using random linear encoding. Uh, efficiently here means that we get an additive over uh, we get an additive overhead of s, where s is a statistical security parameter in the amount of oblivious transfers we need to do. Um, and that's actually not a lot in this case because we are multiplying very large numbers, so it means that we do several thousand OTs. To ensure that a party basically commits to its input from the beginning from when we construct the candidates all the way to the end when the keys are constructed. We put some commitments to this and verify these at the end. So commitments are often quite expensive. So we come up with, uh, with, a, with, a, with a new scheme which basically allows to make very cheap commitments assuming we only want to ever use one of these commitments. So that, that's, that's a bit of a weird thing. It might be applicable in other situations. Um, I will go into detail with that in a moment. Uh, and finally, to ensure uh, correctness of the biprimality test, in case of a malicious, ma uh, malicious adversary, we uh, basically use the standard tool of putting some, turning this into a standard zero knowledge proof. Okay, uh, so let me mention this issue with uh, consistency. Basically, we, what we do is we commit and notice the quotation mark, using AES. Um, what this means is that the commi commitment is not in and of itself 
uh, binding, but because it turns out we only need to open two commitments in the end, we can, uh, we can, uh, we can do some zero knowledge verification that ensures that, ensures that this particular commitment is correct, and that's actually all we need since we allow the adversary to fail good candidates. So basically the overall idea is that in a setup phase, uh, Alice picks a random key, commits to it towards Bob, then they execute a zero knowledge proof uh, that this commitment is, uh, is correct. Uh, and afterwards, what they do is they use this key to uh, commit to shares. Uh, the zero knowledge proof here is needed since our simulator must know whatever key uh, the malicious party Alice in this case uses to uh, commit to her shares. And thus we get extractability of that from the, from the zero knowledge proof. So this means that later on we can extract whatever she inputs to these commitments. Um, to verify the modulus again, we execute, uh, to, to, to get maliciously secure back from LT test, we, we uh, follow the step as before by, uh, by Bonnier and Franklin, but uh, what we add on top is uh, the typical uh, zero knowledge um, aspect where we pick some randomness uh, and then make some challenge depending on this, where at some point the other party gets to pick a bit, either it actually learns what this randomness was or what this randomness uh, plus the actual secret we work on was, the actual witness. Uh, again, this means that we do need to repeat it, uh, repeat it uh, as times to ensure this with uh, negligible probability. And because this zero knowledge proof needs to be composable with the rest of the protocols, we also need to commit to this challenge and verify it later on. And this is also, again, where we can get use these AES-based commitments. All right, so the end of all of this is that we, we now, we give the adversary a lot of power, we allow him a lot of cheating uh, during, during this protocol. And the important thing is that we must in the end ensure that whatever we accept has actually been, been, been done correctly. So this means in the end we execute a zero knowledge, uh, zero knowledge proof that verifies the commitments to the shares that have been used to construct the moduli are actually those that were committed to using the AES scheme along with the challenges that were used in the biprimality, uh, biprimality test. Uh, and, um, and basically, we noticed that we can do this kind of zero knowledge, since it's of basically AES circuits. We can do this very efficiently using Gauss gobbled, uh, gobbled circuit uh, by some approach by Yavarik et al. From, from, uh, from, from earlier on. So when we put all this together, uh, we get our maliciously secure scheme with basically the only overhead of adding the, uh, adding the, the AES-based commitments, which are very light in the grand scheme of things. The uh, biprimality proof must be maliciously secure, but this only actually needs to be done once for the entire protocol, not for each of the candidates or anything like that. So this also does only add some constant overhead. The same with the zero knowledge proof. It's also a little bit heavy. Again, it's only done once in the grand scheme of things. So this means that we actually get this maliciously secure protocol very cheaply on top of the semi-honest. So uh, we, implemented, uh, we implemented this for constructing 2048-bit RSA. Uh, just a little bit of detail of the implementation. We, of course, used AES-NI uh, for doing AES and where we used the PRG. Uh, we used OT extension uh, by Keller et al to uh, implement all the OTs, which is more or less the only uh, really big uh, cryptographic primitive uh, other than AES we use in this protocol. The zero knowledge was done using, uh, using the garbled circuits approach, and basically most of the uh, primitives that are computed otherwise in the protocol are based on OpenSSL. So we ran some experiments on this, uh, on uh, the Azure service for using a, a CN machine. And uh, what we get, uh, the numbers we get is uh, for a single thread, we get uh, a lowest time of 56 seconds and the highest time of 182 seconds. Um, uh, sorry, highest time of 598 seconds and uh, average of 182. So there's a very big variance here. Uh, and the reason is probably that this is actually an extremely random process. We don't know how quickly we actually end up getting some, uh, some good va values. Uh, so this is based on an average of 30 times. Uh, 30 executions. And this is actually also consistent with the big variants that have been reported in previous implementations of this. Uh, I think the main result to highlight is that for an eight threaded implementation, we managed to get an average of 40, about 40, 41 seconds. 
and that the comparison is uh, uh, some work by Hasai et al. from 2012, where they get the best times of 15 minutes for the a semi honest uh, protocol. So we get a big difference. When we look at where uh, the time is actually, uh, actually spent, uh, we see that the, the zero knowledge aspects actually don't take a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of the total time, as I argued. So this is basically the thing that uh, gives the malicious security, and it's, uh, it doesn't contribute a lot. Uh, the main thing is actually the construction of the modulus. I should here mention that this also involves the prevention of selective failure, which might actually end up taking a bit of the time. So this is definitely where we would like to, uh, to shave a bit of time off. So some, uh, some concluding uh, remark. Uh, we basically showed a new protocol for maliciously secure distributed RSA key generation in the two-party setting where we get malicious security almost for free. Uh, it doesn't rely on specific number theoretic assumptions since basically everything is shoved into oblivious transfers. We also showed a proof of concept um, implementation. Among other things, we managed to use this, uh, this, this, this weird construction with the AES for uh, uh, lightly extractable commitments where only some of it has to be used. And we also show some way of uh, doing selective failure prevention when you do OT uh, for multiplication of large numbers. So yeah, thank you for sticking around and uh, thank you for your attention.